Daphne are ready for the word. Come on, let's give it up for Pastor Len McClone, who has a powerful word tonight. Come on, let's encourage him. Amen. Come on, Pastor, you got this. May the Lord use you with power. Let's go. Love you, bro. TLC. TLC, who's ready for the word? Yeah, do I got any Bible nerds in here that's ready to eat the word of God with me? Yeah, let's nerd out. You ready? <laughs> I'm going to ask you to, to stay, to stay um, standing while I, I read the word. It's 1 Kings 19, 1 to 4. We're going to jump right into it. Uh, we're going to jump right into 1 Kings 19. We're actually going to break it down uh, a couple verses at a time. Y'all ready? Amen. 1 Kings 19, 1 to 4. It says, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elisha had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elisha saying, so let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life of, uh, as, as the, uh, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow this time. It's a threat against Elisha's life. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life. He went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. He prayed that he might die. And said, it is enough now, O Lord, take my life. For I am no better than my father's. That is the word of God. You may be seated. That is the word of God. You know, that, th this story, this account of Elijah's life reminds me of a, a heavyweight boxer. Some of y'all might know him. Does anybody in here have a, a Foreman grill? A George Foreman grill? Praise the Lord. And everybody who can't cook said amen. <laughs> George Foreman was a big, strong, intimidating heavyweight boxer. He was the undisputed champion of the world. He had crazy power that the world had never seen before. And he even beat up the people that, that beat up Muhammad Ali. He beat the people that beat him. He knocked them clean out. So George Foreman and Muhammad Ali agreed to a fight. Now listen, George Foreman's big, huggable, lovable. He's always smiling. He's joyful when you see him now because he's getting that Foreman grill money. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but back in the day when he was boxing, forget it. He rarely, if ever, smiled. He, was always, he always had a mean mug on his face. He was about that business. He was trying to hurt you. A lot, of, a lot of the experts said that Muhammad Ali didn't stand a chance. They said he was going to get knocked out. Many of them believed he would get hurt. So when the rumble in the jungle started, George Foreman's wailing on Muhammad Ali, comes out the gate swinging, showing his incredible power. And all Muhammad Ali could do was, was get on the ropes and cover up. He could cover up. Every now and then he would he'd throw a jab and a quick right, but, but he'd cover up. Round two, same thing. George Foreman comes out swinging, boom, 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 landing haymakers, boom, boom, boom. And, and, and Muhammad Ali's just on the ropes. He can't really do much. Boom, he's picking and choosing little spots, but he's covering up to protect himself from the power of George Foreman. Same thing in round three. Same thing in round four. Same thing in round five. What's going on with Ali? He ain't even throwing no punches. Same thing in round six. Same thing in round seven. By this time, George Foreman is, is running out of gas. He's, 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 his tank is getting low. He's starting to run on E. What happened? What happened? Well, in round eight, he comes out. He can barely land a punch. He looks exhausted. He actually looks real sloppy. He don't look like the champion of the world. What was happening was the greatness of Muhammad Ali. He was employing a tactic called the rope-a-dope, where he would just let the other person exhaust all of their energy. He was letting big, for, big George Foreman exhaust all of his strength and all of his power. Until that moment where Ali just came up off the ropes in round eight and landed a, a clean right, clean jab and a clean right, right to his face. He hit him with the two-piece and the biscuit and knocked George Foreman down on the ground. And he couldn't get up. He picked a perfect time when he was running on E to land two clean shots. It wasn't the power that knocked him out. It was that he was so exhausted that he could not get up off the canvas. And Muhammad Ali shocked the world and became the, the champion of the world in the, in the rumble in the jungle. He waited for the perfect time to strike. And it was a time in George Foreman's life when he was running on E. They asked big, big, lovable, huggable George Foreman after he retired about that fight. He said, there was a time in the fight where I had wished I had died. 
He went through a long depression. He was never really the same fighter after that. The title of my sermon tonight is called Running on E. Running on E. We're going to talk about the prophet Elisha. He was a powerful prophet of God being used in a time when God's people were rebellious. They were idolatrous. And Israel's kings, uh, Israel's king Ahab and, and his evil wife Jezebel were out to extinguish the things of God from the land of Israel. They instituted Baal worship where they would have their, uh, the, the, the inhabitants of Israel sacrifice their children uh, and, their, and their babies to the fire in, in, a, in a form of worshiping Baal. It was really gruesome and grotesque. They instituted Baal worship. It became the national religion of Israel. And Ahab was the king, but his wife was running things. I don't know if there's any man can say amen right there. <laughs> Jezebel was killing all the prophets of God. It was a mess. In chapter 18, Elisha challenges 450 false prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel to see whose God was the real God. Yahweh or Baal? He said, the, the God that answers by fire is the true God. The prophets of Baal can't get Baal to do nothing. Then Elisha calls down fire from heaven and everyone is amazed. Elisha proves God is real and Baal is not, but then he slaughters 450 of the false prophets of Baal. Hmm. He killed them all like a scene out of Kill Bill. It was, it was, it was crazy. And next he prays for, for the drought to end. There was a three and a half year drought that, that where there was no rain. And he prayed to God and God answered. He sent the rain. Then he, then he gets supernatural speed laid upon them by God Almighty. And he runs about 15 miles uh, all the way back at about 50 miles an hour back to the, the capital city of Israel. He was, he was, he was being used by God. How many, how many people know he was being used by God? I mean, I come out of a prayer service feeling like I can conquer the world. This man must have been. Wow. Can you imagine how he felt? Surely there'll be repentance in the land. I mean, God showed out. He showed off. Surely they're going to repent. Surely God will be worshipped again. Surely we've seen the end of Baal, right? This is how he's feeling. But when he returns, he finds that to his surprise, nothing changed. Nothing changed. God's not being worshipped. There's no repentance. Baal is still running rampant, the worship of Baal. To make matters worse, when Ahab tells Jezebel what Elisha did, she goes off. Elisha receives a message. He receives a message from Jezebel's messenger. It reveals that she's going to kill him by this time tomorrow. And his life spiraled out of control. Elisha's coming off one of the greatest miracles known to man, only to be met by even greater opposition. Much like big George Foreman, who had given Ali his best shots. He gave him all his power. He went from the highest point of his career to the lowest. And we see Elisha go from his highest point in ministry to the lowest. Elisha felt like he had given Ahab and Jezebel his best shot. He just knew he whooped him. He knew he had, he had, he had finished him once and for all. But what happens when you hit Goliath with everything you got and he doesn't fall? What happens when you shout with everything you got, but the walls of Jericho don't fall? What happens when you're praying and fasting, but Jezebel don't, don't budge? What happens when you're crying out to the Lord and seeking God's face, but the stronghold doesn't break? I know somebody in here can relate to what I'm saying. What happens then? What do you do? You hold on. You wait for God. Is anybody waiting on God in this place? I believe, I believe that I need to wait on God before I start to move. But Elisha, he became fearful. He ran for his life and left his servant. He ditched the call of God on his life. He quit the ministry. He ran some more full day's journey into the wilderness till he became exhausted. He prayed to God, take my life, God. He felt ineffective. He felt like a failure. Have you ever felt ineffective? What do you do? How do you respond? God used Elisha to bring a dead boy back to life. Elisha was consumed by the, by the things of He was consumed with zeal and fervor for the things of the Lord. But then he became consumed with the threat that was revealed upon his life. He became consumed by fear, intimidation. He became consumed by anxiety, depression, fatigue, and exhaustion. He was exhausted. Has anybody ever been exhausted in here? Has anybody ever been totally and utterly exhausted? Oh, somebody said amen. Somebody said amen. Somebody said amen. Hmm. Elisha was running on E. 
But what is exhaustion? How do we, listen, exhaustion is extreme weakness or fatigue. To be exhausted is to be extremely fatigued. There's a, there's a definition, uh, of a, of the secondary definition means to, to be totally consumed by something. The total consumption of something, if you think about big George Foreman, his power had been exhausted. His strength had been exhausted. Elisha didn't get a command, but he left and ran on his own strength until he collapsed under the broom tree. He ran until his strength was exhausted. It was totally consumed. And according to WebMD, exhaustion can be caused by anxiety. It can be caused by depression, bipolar disorder, neurological and sleep disorders, anemia and other medical ailments. It can be caused by too much physical activity with no rest. Overworked, overextended, burnt out. Those are common terms nowadays. Exhaustion. What happens when exhaustion hits you and you already had an Elisha moment? Signs of exhaustion are an inability to set goals and stick to them. Lack of concentration and focus. Inability to nurture relationships. You just handing your kids tablets and phones so that you ain't gotta mentally deal with them. Inability to give your spouse adequate attention because you're emotionally incapable. You're exhausted. Anybody ever been exhausted in this place? Am I preaching to myself? Is exhaustion something that we need to talk about in the church? Come on, somebody. You ever feel exhausted when you just, you just sitting and you ever talk to somebody? And you just sitting and you just talking, having a conversation? And dag, by the time you're done, you ain't move a muscle. You, you, you exerted no physical energy, but you exhausted. Golly, I'm emotionally drained. My tank is on E. What's going on? I, spiritually, I feel like I lifted a thousand pounds. I'm exhausted from one conversation. You ain't exert no energy. But emotionally, you get drained. Exhaustion is a real thing. Every day, think about it. Every day we're juggling. Listen to these lists. Every day we're juggling and, and doing balancing acts, right? Think about this. Think about your work demands. Work projects, work deadlines, work quotas, work responsibilities. Think about your work-related financial pitfalls. Work volatility and instability. Think about that. Think about the threats to your job security. Layoffs and furloughs, severances. Think about working overtime. You're not taking vacations, toxic work environments. Toxic employees, toxic bosses, toxic co-workers, you're bringing your work home because you can't leave work at work. You're tossing and turning in your sleep because you're not, you, you, you're thinking about work, you're dreaming about work. No wonder we get exhausted. Exhaustion. Exhaustion. Ba balance that with family responsibilities. Doing kids' homework, school and school events, school projects, cooking and cleaning. Giving each child individual attention that they deserve. Family issues. Family drama. The whole church said Amen. Giving your spouse attention and devotion, planning activities, paying bills, tending to your house, exercise and physical health, COVID hitting, health problems, health threats, making sure you're getting adequate sleep at night. We got family issues. We got family problems. We got to tend to our families and we got to balance that with work stress and work demands. A lot of people in here are in school as well. And, and school has its own burdens and own responsibilities and own demands on you as well. Many of us are serving in ministry with ministry deadlines. Can we talk about it? Ministry planning, ministry meetings, church functions, volunteering and assisting, teaching preparations to make sure you're rightly dividing the scriptures, preaching preparations to make sure you're rightly dividing the scriptures and studying and, and fasting and, 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 and being available to give counsel at all, all hours of the night. Quiet time for God and making sure we're getting it in. Daily devotionals while juggling multiple ministries without overextending. Work demands, family demands, ministry demands. You ever get exhausted every now and then? See, we don't even talk about Sabbaths because, you know, in a lot of Christian circles, it's looked at as weakness. I don't need to rest. I just put that work in. But then we make mockery out of God because God rested for a full day and told us if we trust him with more and we do less, he can do more. Oh, but come on, somebody. Have you ever, have you ever heard that? Have you ever, we got to give God the glory that he deserves. I believe God can do more when I do less. Praise the Lord. I'm not buying the lie of Satan that says that God was tripping when he made a Sabbath. You don't need a Sabbath. You Superman. You bugging. I'm not Superman. God is. Somebody got to recognize my God has me. I'm in God's hands.
The enemy turns a blessing from God, a day of rest, into something that's looked at as weakness. If you're always busy, you always got something to do, you're always on the go, but then you're irritable in the mug. <laughs> You've adapted the world's motto of I sleep when I'm dead. You might be exhausted, and if you're not right now, you might be at one point, and if you're not dead, you might die. It's a reason we need to rest. Maybe that's why we're always battling the spirit of Jezebel. I can't let the church know how I feel because, you know, they'll crucify me. That's not of God. We need to be an emotionally healthy church. We need to be an emotionally, spiritually, and physically healthy church. I rebuke that spirit of Jezebel, that intimidation spirit that makes you think you got to be quiet when you're going through some things. That makes you think you got to keep the truth to yourself. I rebuke that garbage. My God said the truth shall set you free. Somebody need to be set free tonight in the name of Jesus. Trying to hold me hostage so we can't express our feelings, our true feelings. All these demands and responsibilities in the world. The one place I should feel safe expressing the truth is in the house of the Lord. Our souls become exhausted and we get emotionally drained daily when we don't replenish our inner beings, our inner person. Elisha was fearful. He was fatigued. He felt like a failure. He was exhausted. Maybe you've gone through an extreme high to an extreme low point in your life. Maybe you're running on E, but tonight there is hope for you. God has something to say about this. You're not alone. God knows how you feel. He doesn't want you to try and refill on your own. Tonight, I want you to know that the grace of God is the fuel that refills our empty tanks. I got to say that again. The grace of God is what refuels our empty tanks. Praise the Lord. WebMD says to alleviate exhaustion, we start by identifying the causes. We address sleeping habits. We address foods that we eat. Talk therapy and counseling and psychotherapy. This is needed. Crazy. We see God do this exact thing with Elisha. Elisha was fearful, but God's favor showed up in a mighty way. And tonight we're going to talk about three ways that God refills our tanks when we're running on E. The first way, by God's grace, he gives us rest and refreshment. <laughs> it's not a crazy revelation, <laughs> but he lets us rest. God is good. He gives us refreshment for our souls, for our spirits. He gives us refreshment for our physical bodies. He gives us rest and refreshment. Come on. Elisha ran for his life in verse 3. Then in verse 4, it says he told God to take his life. He ran for his life in verse 3, but then he tells God to take his life. Make up your mind, bro. You ever been so exhausted that you don't know what's going on? You're saying all kinds of stuff. You're talking crazy. You're thinking crazy. You're doing crazy stuff. You're hangry. What you want, bro? Get to get it. How you say this? What you want, bro? If you really want to die, why not just stand and face Jezebel like a man? And, and you might have a chance of defeating it because didn't God just rain down fire from heaven? Or am I tripping? I'm reading a different. That's not a, you know, what translation? What's going on here? Elisha needed to rest. God spared his life. He ain't sent an angel to kill him. He didn't leave him to die. He chose to restore him. God is committed to restoring us even when we're not committed to him. Woo! What does that do to your theology, though? <laughs> God is committed to restoring us even when we're not committed to him. He quit the ministry and left his servant. I'm out. I'm done. He gave up on his calling. He ain't wait on God. He ran off on his own strength. He abandoned his post. Tells God, this is too much. It's a wrap. Take away my life. I'm done. This type of talk is not uncommon in the scriptures. Right. Moses got so discouraged, he told God, kill me now, God. Right. Jonah preached the message of repentance to Nineveh, which led to a crazy revival. And still he tells God, please take my life. Wow. The Bible says the apostle Paul even despaired of life itself. Are you going to tell me that you're a super Christian and you don't go, get, get, you know, go through times of despair? You don't go through times of, 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 of attacks? You've never been discouraged. Man, thank God for his realness in the word, though, that inspires us and encourages us and lets us know there's other men and women of God, powerful men of God, that have gone through the same things. The Bible says Elisha was a man just like us. 
Elisha's story, God's grace is best seen, not when he's doing the miraculous, the supernatural, the crazy things, and, and uh, with using Elijah mightily. That's not when we see God's grace the best. We see God's grace most vividly when Elisha is out of fellowship with God. When he's out of fellowship, we see the grace come in like a flood. Come on, somebody theology getting turned upside down right now. Come on. God's grace comes in and just rescues us in a way that we don't even understand or expect. His favor showed up in the way that he handled Elisha's restoration process. I know you're tired. Go ahead and get some rest. I see you, Elisha. I see you running. I see you. I see you. I know you're depressed. Go ahead and go ahead and get some sleep. God knows sometimes the physical needs to be cared for before the spiritual can be at its best. He ain't strike him dead. He ain't rebuke him. He ain't shame him or guilt him or manipulate him. He ministers to Elisha with gentleness and wisdom, infinite wisdom. God's grace allowed Elisha to sleep. Some of y'all need a nap out here. <laughs> Not right now, though. I'm preaching, all right? But some of y'all need to take a nap. Real talk, nap, nap. Straight up. <laughs> the great football coach Vince Lombardi said, fatigue makes cowards out of all of us. Ain't that crazy? He knows something about winning. Fatigue makes cowards out of all of us. Woo! The truth is the truth no matter who it comes from. Nothing recharges like a good sleep. You know that good sleep where you, you got your arm and you... And you let me articulate. Let me see, make sure you get the illustration. You, you, you just knocked out, drooling on your arm. It's drool going down. It's running down to the pillow. It's making rivers in dry places. You know what I'm saying? You just knocked out sleep, sleep. That's the, that's, yeah, you sleep. And then you flip the pillow over because it's cooler on that side. And you put your arm underneath. Now you got the slobbery part on your arm. And you start the cycle again, you drooling, and you just drooling, you just drooling, and you can, you, some of y'all need that big old nasty sleep of God that only God can give you, where it could be tanks in your living room busting off scud missiles, and you just, you just out, you in sleep, come on, how many people know that God gives rest and restoration for my soul, hallelujah, yeah, that's the God that I serve. We can easily ne neglect and ignore times when we need to rest and regroup and pull back from life's demands so God can refresh our souls. Anybody need, in need of a refreshment in here? Every now and then, I just, need a, I just need you to refresh my soul, Lord. Work demands, school demands, family demands, ministry demands. We take on task after task until it overflows. And so often, we just keep on going. You know, I, I'm, yeah, of course, you know, my family asked me to do something. I'm going to say, no, yeah, I got you. Yeah let, me, yeah, let me help you. Let me do what I can. Let me, yeah, let me come through when you need it. Okay, I got you. I got you. I'm there. I'm there. I, yeah, of course. I ain't going to say no. You know, I ain't going to say no. I'm going to say yes. Say yes. That's what we do, right? Yeah, bitch, say yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. I got you. It's a Christian thing to do. We don't say no. When our boss asks us to work overtime and, you know, he needs something, we ain't going to say no. Yeah, 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 I got you. Because we want to look like we want to be there, right? We want to look like we're thankful because we're Christians. And we're supposed to work like we're doing it for the Lord. We're supposed to work with excellence. So we don't, yeah, I got you. Yeah, 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 yeah. What you need? How many hours you want me to work extra? Um, you, you, know, you know, we just do it. We don't, we don't really say no because we want, we want that favor. We want that, you know. Ministry demands, yeah, yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah, I'll help. I'll do a little bit more here. I'll jump in this ministry, that ministry. I'll do this. Yeah, yeah, I'll help over here. Yeah, you know, no, no, yeah, I got you. I got you. What you need? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're going over here. We're doing missions. We're doing this. We're doing that. We do it. We want. That's our hearts because we love God. We just want to love. We just want to serve God. It's, it's like we become fearful of saying no. We become fearful of saying no. You're telling me Jezebel ain't up in this thing every, every now and then? We become fearful if we can't see with the spiritual eye, if we can't see prophetically, we become spirit, we become fearful of, of, of saying no because the yes gets all the glory. Oh, it's the yes that gets all the glory. I, uh, I'm preaching to myself. Psalm 23, 2 says, He lets me rest in green pasture. He lets me rest. He lets me, he allows me to rest. He gives me rest. He leads me to calm waters. Psalm 127, 2b says, the Lord gives sleep to those that he loves. In verses 5 to 7, 
It reads, then as he lay, slept under a, he, he slept under a broom tree. Suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Then he, then he looked, and, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. In the Old Testament, the description of the angel of the Lord is generally seen as a Christophany. And many theologians believe that's what this is here. A Christophany is a description of a pre-incarnate Jesus in the Old Testament, whenever you see the angel of the Lord. Man, this is, this is crazy. God sent his son to personally minister to Elisha while Elisha was out of fellowship with him. <laughs> Woo, who knows where Elisha would have been? Where was he going to find food? Where was he going to find water? He was exhausted. He was George Foreman out. He wasn't able to get it. Like, he probably would have died right there, but, but God in his grace... You can say Jesus saved him. Oh, he sent his son to rescue Elisha when he was out of fellowship. Where were you? What kind of desert were you? What kind of dry place were you in when he sent his son to come and rescue you? Come on, some of y'all were close to touching hell, but then Jesus showed up on the scene with living water and the bread of life. He said, eat my son, I got you. God has a message for you. Where were you? Somebody was about to touch you. Somebody was in the pits when the Lord came and pulled you out of some things. While we were yet sinners, he said, he sent his son. The angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Jesus, he whipped up some bread and breakfast for Elisha. You know, a little bread and protein shake. No, I'm tripping. It was actually the bread of life and living water, if we're going to be theologically accurate. He laid hands on him. He touched him. He gave him. He gave him short hands. He let him know he's there. Sometimes you just need to know that some people are there. Sometimes you just need somebody to lay some hands on you. Oh, he gives nourishment for his soul before recommissioning him. <laughs> Ooh, he, he nourishes him before he gives him an assignment. And you know, Jesus didn't even say a word. He didn't even say a word. He refreshes his body. Getting his spirit right. Because he wasn't in the right condition to receive a word. I wonder who's not in the right condition to receive a word. Who's exhausted? We know Elisha's spirit was off because he didn't even say thank you, right? Like, yo, you, know, you just got the bread of life. You even... Yet God is still patient and he, 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 he begins to minister, minister to Elisha's spirit. Look what he does in verse 4. Elisha prayed to God. He said, it is enough, God. Take my life. It is enough. It is enough, he says. Take my life. And with that, that phrase, it is enough in the Hebrew, actually means it's too great. It's too great. It's too great, God. But Jesus lets Elisha know, the pre-incarnate Jesus or the angel of the Lord lets Elisha know that God hears him by repeating that phrase when he woke him up the second time. He said, arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. He lets him know that God hears him. Even though he's tripping, God hears him. Even though he's wilding out and being disobedient, God hears him. Even though he's far from God and out of fellowship, God hears him. It is too great. <laughs> Has anybody ever felt like the journey was too great? Has anybody ever felt like this is too great? Has anybody ever felt like the threats on your life were too great? Has anybody ever felt like that intimidation, that fear over your life is too great? It's too great, God. Have you ever cried out to God in that way? It's too great, Lord. It's too great. The journey to walk in Christ is too great. Yeah, it is too great. I want you to know tonight that God hears you. He's saying, yes, you're right, my son. Yes, you're right, my daughter. It is too great. It's too great. It's too great for you to do on your own strength. It's too great for you to do without eating of my word. It's too great to try to do it by yourself. It's too great to do it without fellowship. It is too great. I hear you. I hear you. It is too great. You need to eat of my word. Drink of the living water. Because this journey in Christ is too great not to. Come on, somebody got to give God a praise in this place. It's too great. The grace of God gives us rest and refreshment. You know what else he does? He also lets us vent. <laughs> Woo, he lets us vent our frustrations. He lets us vent. He lets us vent. He created venting. A lot of y'all feel better. I'm going to go home and vent tonight. I'm going to vent to my wife. Let us say something. 
in the spirit. Of he lets us cry. Get it out, vent. Go ahead and vent. Go ahead and vent. Go ahead and vent. Go ahead and vent. Yeah, this journey is great. Go ahead and vent. He lets us travail and cry out to him. He lets us travail and, and, and with loud cries and groanings. He gives us groanings too deep for words through his spirit that we can vent to him. He lets us pray to him. This is what we see Elisha do. He, he vents to our great God. What kind of God lets you vent like that? Like, dang. Verses 8 to 10. Verses 8 to 10 say, so he arose, ate and drank, and he went on his own strength 40 days and 40 nights. And the strength, excuse me, he went on the strength of the food 40 days and 40 nights. As far as Orb, the Mount of God, and there he went into a cave, spent the night in that place, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elisha? So he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They torn down your altars, they killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Elijah, strengthened by the supernatural catering of Christ, <laughs> he heads to Mount Oreb, also known as Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. This is where God revealed himself to Moses, but the difference was Moses was looking for the glory of the presence of God. Elijah is looking for solitude in a dark cave. Moses is looking for the glory. Is anybody looking for the glory? Who's looking for the glory of the presence? Who, who wants to be in the presence of God? Who just wants a glimpse? Even if it's the backside, I just want a glimpse of the glory of God. But something's off if you're looking for solitude, isolation in a dark, dark cave. God says, what are you doing here, Elisha? Simple statement. So like God, just a simple statement. What are you doing here, Elisha? Elisha was physically strengthened, but he was struggling emotionally still. He was still emotionally running on E. And there's no evidence in the text that, that says that he was instructed to go to Mount Oreb. But, you know, he shows up at the mountain of God, not because, you know, he was necessarily instructed. But he, he, he was still running. He was still running. I mean, I, you know, I wonder how many people here are still running. I know you got saved, but are you running for some things? I know you got a word of God over your life. You got prophesied to, but are you running for some things? Oh, I know the man of God told you what it was, but are you still running for some things? Do you got a calling over your life and you still running? You still, I know you saved. I know you love God, but are you still, what you running from? What you running to? Did he call you out of some things that you're still running to? Or maybe you run into some things that, that, that he's, he's, he's telling you not to go to. What you running from? Are you exhausted from running? Fear? What you scared of? Intimidation? I thought this was the church of Christ. What you running from? There's definitely times when solitude is needed, but when you're in depression, anxiety, that's not one of them. That's not one of them. You need somebody to minister to your psyche. You need somebody that you can vent to. You need somebody to talk to. You need wise counsel. You got to keep good company. Good company. Good company. And this is what we see God doing. He allows Elisha to vent real quick. He's giving Elisha talk therapy. Yeah. He's giving him therapy for his soul. He's counseling him. He's, he's giving him therapy for his psyche. He's working on his mind and his emotions by asking one simple statement. What are you doing here, Elisha? God already knew, but this is self-eval, self-evaluation, self-assessment. This is self-awareness for Elisha. 1 Peter 5, 7 says to cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He's letting us vent. He's telling us to vent. He wants to hear. He wants to know. He already know, but he still want to know. God allows us the grace to get it off your chest. <laughs> Woo, praise God, I can vent. Praise God for that. Sometimes we need to... Say some things out loud so we can sound how silly. We can hear how silly we sound, you know. We, we can, <laughs> sometimes we need to hear ourselves when we sound foolish with authority. <laughs> Yo. <laughs> Elisha vents and he speaks on every level how he's feeling. Think about it. Physically, he says, I'm the only one here. I'm alone. Spiritually, he says, I'm the only voice left for God. Psychologically and emotionally, he says, and they try to kill me. That's venting. He expresses why he's in that dark cave. And when you're exhausted and you, you know, you're anxious, you're depressed, 
You feel alone, you feel guilty, you feel ineffective. You hide in caves and you, you keep your feelings bottled up to yourself because you, the enemy's tricked you into thinking nobody cares, nobody wants to hear, nobody can relate anyway, but I rebuke that garbage in the name of Jesus. The truth shall set you free. God is the perfect minister. And when Elisha thinks he needs to run, God allows him to rest. Yeah, Elisha thinks he needs to run, but God allows him to rest. Elisha thinks he needs solitude, and God says, nah, you need fellowship. When Elisha prays to die, God says, you need to live. Elisha thinks he needs to hide in caves, but God tells him to come out. You think you need to hide in caves, but God is saying, come out. Come out. Come out. Come out of that cave of despair. Come out of that cave of darkness. Come out of that cave of isolation. Come out of that cave of depression. Come out of that cave of anxiety and exhaustion. Somebody got to come out. You think you need to be hidden in a cave, but God says you need to be hidden in Christ. Somebody got to come out of that cave. Get hidden in his son. Come on, somebody. Can the whole church say amen or what? Come out of that cave in the name of Jesus. You think you need to hide in caves. You need to be hidden in Christ. What are you doing here, Elisha? This is the mountain of God. You gave up the ministry, so why are you here? Elisha officially invites God to his pity party. <laughs> he like, God, you know I'm super holy. <laughs> they killing all your prophets. I'm alone, Jezebel crazy. Israel desecrating on your name. I'm the only one left and they trying to kill me, God. <laughs> God asked him the question twice and both times he responds in the same manner. Such an indirect answer, but in verses 15 to 18, we see that God still shows him favor by recommissioning him. He wasn't done with him. Giving him an assignment, he, anoints, he tells him to anoint Haziel, a pagan king of Syria, to punish the people of Israel for their disobedience and their sinfulness and their idolatry. He says, anoint Jehu to, to be king over Israel, and he's going to take care of the, the, Isabel, uh, the, the Jezebel problem for you. He says, anoint Elisha to eventually replace you down the road. I'm not done with you, but eventually he's going to minister to you. He's going to serve you. But my work shall continue. Oh, yeah, and, you know, there's 7,000 others in Israel who have not bent the knee to bail. Just so you know, just so you're comfortable, he answers everything, he addresses everything that Elisha vents about, even though he was not in his right mind. Come on. Isn't he a good father? God recommissioned Elisha, but that's only after he shifts his focus back to him. Somebody say, shift, shift your focus. Shift your focus. God shifts his focus back to him. There was a time when my focus was off. Every now and then, we, we lose track of what God's telling us to focus on. Amen? Don't leave me hanging. Amen? <laughs> All right, cool. As long as I ain't the only one. <laughs> Last year, December 24th, my wife and I had an argument. Ooh. We, we, we human, we real people. We had a disagreement. Christmas Eve and we had a disagreement and I was like, you know what, let me just leave. Let me go, because I, you know, I'm gonna zip it like pastor's always saying, I'm just gonna leave before the situation escalate. Because when my wife get in her flesh, she get all the way in her flesh. <laughs> all the way. She don't leave no room, she goes all the way in. <laughs> so let me just go. And I'm hot, I'm, I'm, I'm big mad, I'm, I'm, I'm upset. So I leave, I said, you know what, let me just go to this lake. There's a lake in Port St. Lucie, it's huge. It's kind of like a park. And I sit on the, the bench and I'm texting on my phone and I'm upset. And I asked my wife if I could share the story because we're we gonna get vulnerable tonight. You know what I'm saying? So I'm sitting there texting, I'm mad at, I'm mad. I don't even wanna, I don't even wanna text God. Like I'm texting to an imaginary therapist on my notepad because I'm big mad and I, and I feeling like I'm alone in my household sometimes, feeling like I'm, I'm alone, I'm feeling like I, I'm all by myself. I don't even remember, my wife doesn't even remember what we were arguing about. But I remember where it took me spiritually, where the argument led physically, where the argument led mentally. I remember what happened and where it took me spiritually. I was in my feelings and I'm, and I'm venting on my phone about 
my wife not really wanting more of God. She don't wake up in the morning like, oh my gosh, Lord, I can't wait to see how you use me today. It's not her. And that's cool. It's okay. It's not her yet. She don't be like, oh, I can't wait to wake up and fast and pray and get in the word for hours and hours. And that's just not her. Sometimes it's hard for me to deal with because, you know, I want my daughters to have a, a, a visual of what it's like to have somebody in their home every night. A, a godly woman that's praying and seeking God and on fire for the things of God. My focus was off. About 50 yards away, a young man walks up, pants sagging. He's, he's rapping to, you know, he got music playing on his phone. He's rapping. He lights a blunt. He's smoking weed in broad daylight, like 12 o'clock, just smoking. And I felt the prompting of the Lord, go preach the gospel to that man. I said, nah, God, I'm, I'm not done. I'm venting. I'm upset. I'm venting to an imaginary therapist. I'm not done. I'm hot. I'm, I'm, I'm really upset. I look back at the kid, and he's blowing smoke in the air. Rapping, living, he thinks he's living his best life. He felt the prompting of the Lord again. Go preach the gospel to that young man. I'm like, nah, God, I'm upset. I'm done. I'm over it. I'm over it. I feel like Elisha. I feel alone. I feel anxiety because I'm thinking about my little girls. I'm thinking about the future in this world and how dirty and ugly it is. And I'm like, dang, this is, I feel alone sometimes. I need, I need help. I need encouragement sometimes. And, 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 and I'm not getting, I feel alone. I look up and the kid, the young man standing in front of me. And he says, you know where I can find some hopes? I said, what? He said, you know where I can find some bees? Where the bees at? And he's saying bees. He's referring to women with foul language. And I'm already upset. I'm thinking about my girls. And here he comes talking out the side of his face about women. So now I'm hot, hot. <laughs> My flesh started rising. I'm like, dang, am I starting to act like my wife? Because I'm about to get up and hit this dude. <laughs> Justin, I was about to hit dude, bro. <laughs> and I felt the peace of the Lord come over me as the prompting hit me again. Preach the gospel to that young man. So I looked at him, I said, nah, bro, I can't help you with all that, but I do know where you can find Jesus. You came to the right one today. He looks at me, he's cursing, he's like, man, I ain't with all that. You know, F all of that, da 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 I don't believe in none of that garbage. So, oh, okay, all right, well, you know, <clears throat> let me know what you believe in, because you, you, you're asking, what, the things you're asking for and what you're doing right now are just going to leave you in the same place once you all said it, once it's all said and done. So what do you believe in? Because I'm confused. I just start preaching the gospel to this young man. Like five minutes later, my hands on his forehead, both his hands in the air, a blood still burning for all you oversaved people, but he got tears in his eyes, tears welling up as he's crying out to the Lord Jesus to be his Lord and Savior. Somebody in this place got to shift their focus back to God. Shift your focus back to the things of the Lord. Shift your focus. The next morning, the next morning we're opening up presents Sitting under the tree, they're opening presents. My phone's ringing off the hook. It's ringing off the hook. It's ringing. I'm like, who is this? It's family time. I can't be bothered with that. I was this close to turning my phone off. Ringing, ringing. I'm like, you know what? They, they all asking, who is it? Who is it? What's going on? I answer the phone. It's the young man from yesterday. He said, yo, man, I need help. I had to sleep in the woods last night. If you remember Christmas, it was really cold. I had, to, I had to sleep in the woods last night. I don't have nowhere to go. I'm at a hotel in tradition. They won't give me a room. I'm moving out of town. I just need, I need a place tonight. I, it's cold and I, I don't know what to do. I said, I got you. Hang up the phone. My wife and kids looking at me like, yo, what's up? I'm like, I got to go. I'm going to go help this young man. They're like, we opening gifts. It's Christmas Day. What, what you talking about? I explained what happened. The encounter of the young man the day before. And I'm looking at my family, looking at my daughters, and, and I'll never forget the look in their eyes. It wasn't one of disapproval. The look in their eyes was not one of disappointment. It was one of approval. And at that moment, it was like God touched me and said, this is why I need you to shift your focus. Don't worry about your girls. You be the example and they'll follow. I'll take care of them. You be the example. Don't worry about your wife. 
You'll be the example and she'll come shift your focus back to me. Don't worry about your wife. When you're putting together Bible studies on end for hours and hours on end, who takes care of the family? It's your wife. When you're putting together preachings for days and days and weeks and weeks on end, who's holding the family down? It's your wife. Remember when you lost your job? Who encouraged you? Who, who embraced you? Who prophesied the truth of God over your life that I have something better for you? It's your wife. Don't worry about your wife. I got her. Shift your focus back to me. I believe I can get vulnerable in this place tonight with a story like this because somebody needs to shift their focus. I don't do this for me. I don't do this for me. I don't do this for me. I do it so you can be set free. Come on, give God a shout tonight. Hallelujah. Shift your focus. He refused our tanks by allowing us to shift our focus back to him. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this real quick and I'm going to close. It says, then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Behold, the Lord passed by and a great strong wind tore the mountains, broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, a still small voice. So it was when Elisha heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle. He went out and stood in the entrance of the cave, and suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elisha? God tells him to go out of the cave, but Elisha didn't go. His depression, his, his exhaustion still had him tranquilized, still had a hold of him, paralyzed. And up until this point, Elisha had only known God by revelations of his glory, his power, and might. He only knew God by his power and his might. And the Bible says God wasn't in the wind. He wasn't in the earthquake. He wasn't in the fire. But what good is a revelation if God isn't in it? Think about that, church. What good is a revelation? See, God shows him these acts of nature to get his attention. Because up until that point, Elisha had only known God by revelations of his power and might. But what good is a revelation if God isn't in it? See, the whole account of Elisha's life was started by a revelation from, it was started by a revelation from Jezebel's messenger. The queen is going to kill you. A threat against Elisha's life was revealed and Elisha spiraled out of control. Are you responding to the wrong revelation? Hmm. It was Elisha's response to the wrong revelation that led to fear, which led to depression, which led to anxiety, irrational thinking, and eventually exhaustion. Don't let your whole life be thrown off course because of a revelation from the enemy. Don't let threats from the pit of hell make you give up on your purpose. What good is a revelation if God isn't in it? Are you exhausted from running because of the revelation from Jezebel's messenger? I came to tell you tonight that no burden in life, come on somebody, no devil in hell, no lie from Satan, no revelation from the messenger of Jezebel can stop God's favor on your life. I don't know what kind of words you got. I don't know what kind of message you got. I don't know what kind of prophecy you got. Yeah, but if the revelation ain't about God, then God isn't in it. There's no power. Somebody say no power. No power. If God isn't in it, it has no power over your life. What's making you hide in that cave? What's isolating you in darkness? Can you hit the lights? What's isolating you from fellowship, community? You got to shift your focus. You got to come out of that cave. Somebody in this place needs a revelation from God. It wasn't until Elisha heard the gentle whisper that he shifted his focus back to God. He shifted his focus back to God. It wasn't until the revelation of God's still small voice. It wasn't until the revelation of the nearness and the gentleness of our God. It made Elisha cover his face in reverence. Sometimes it's not all glorious power and might. It was the revelation of the gentleness of God that made Elisha walk out of that cave. Cave of depression, cave of despair, cave of darkness, cave of isolation and exhaustion. It was God's revelation of his gentleness and his nearness. The Bible says to cast all of our anxiety on him. See, we know that, but we fail to read what comes before that. 
The Bible says God is near. Cast all our anxiety on him. God is near. Be anxious for nothing. God is near. Go ahead and stand to your, your feet, church. I feel like opening the altar, sometimes we don't look at rest in the right perspective. Sometimes we, we, we move in our own strength and we don't allow God to minister to us in the most effective way. And so tonight, I just want to open up the altar. I feel like the nearness and the gentleness of God is in this place right now. I feel like the nearness and the gentleness of God is in this place to break strongholds, to break down strongholds, to break down lies and tradition, to break down anything that has you yoked up and exhausted. Are you running on E tonight? Are you running on E tonight? I'm gonna leave the altar open.